uh, he went to the recruiting office and uh, he got sort of befuddled and a little tongue-tied and uh, they enlisted him he didn't know just what he was going to volunteer for and so they enlisted him immediately. He was off very fast. So he was in. <laughs> I, I believe, and in fact, we know that you sent him uh, food parcels the whole time he was in Europe. Yes, I tried hard, you know, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Mrs. Jean Rose. Thank you. <laughs> I think you've gone far enough now. <laughs> he thinks we've gone far enough now. <laughs> 1918 and the armistice, and you go back to Canada and to your widowed mother. Now you're the breadwinner. You return to your job at Eaton's, but your years in Europe have made you restless. You look around for fresh fields to conquer. The Canadian National Exhibition of 1919 provides them. So let's return to Canada again for a few moments to hear about it from another old, old friend, William Layla. But I'd rather remember the time when we were on the carnival with a dark game at the Canadian National Exhibition in 1919 and the fun we had building the first stall in the backyard on Degrassi Street. We had Cupid dolls, if you remember, for prizes, and Norm Littlewood's sister made the paper close for them. They were the only modest Cupid dolls on the whole fair. Remember when we all got pinched at Markham for running a housey-housey game? We were all scared stiff. We could see the prison walls looming up before us. But the judge felt sorry for us and just fined us all $10 and let us go. So, Bill, it's been nice talking to you. Hope you can come over and visit us soon and see Toronto since it has grown up. Meantime, best of luck. Well, thank you, William Leyland. And <laughs> let us uh, leave Canada. We want to leave Canada with a reminder again of your days 45 years ago in the 260th, 16th Battalion, and of course of their famous marching song. The band of song, Bill. When, when the bantam roosters crow, you'll find the Germans lying low. Though we're not much in height, say boys, when we fight, just, just count on the chicken. Thank you, gentlemen. They, they used to sing even worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> That was a far cry from the dart stall in Toronto to your first stall at Olympia that we just saw. But soon you've opened your first amusement park at Skegness where you caused quite a stir by introducing for the first time to Britain the Dodgem cars. And as well by popularizing the wall of death. Now we heard, Billy, that you not only uh, trained your own writers for this, but demonstrated to them yourself. Is that true? Yes. I saw it at the Newcastle exhibition. It didn't look very difficult, so we built one and uh, <coughs> trained a lot of people to do it. You had a go yourself. I believe you tried it first on a bicycle. Uh, yes, but uh, it wasn't quite quick enough. <laughs> well, after your success at Skagness, you now decide uh, not to take one stall at Olympia, but the lot. And the late Bertram Mills gives you the concession. All you need is the money. Time is running out, you're desperate, uh, but you just can't find it. Until you drove me to Olympia in a vintage Rolls Royce. He's the person who came into your life at the time of your biggest crisis. Howard Roberts. Yes, it is. Howard Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, Howard, I want you to tell us what your part of this story is. One day, about 30 years ago, Billy Butlin came to see me in my capacity as a senior official of a bank. He wanted to discuss with me his general and financial position. I wanted an overdraft. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I was so impressed by his quiet determination his pluck and his resourcefulness that I felt able to arrange assistance on a much higher scale than is usually afforded. And then he took you over to uh, Olympia to show you what he was doing, didn't he? Indeed he did. Still in that vintage Rolls Royce. When I got in, I was slightly shattered to find that on the impeccable upholstery on the back seat, 
rested a rather oily, greasy Dodgem engine. <laughs> he didn't seem to mind. But when we got to Olympia, I was so enormously impressed to see that the workmen who'd been engaged on erecting one of these giant rides, I think it was the Great Dipper, had stopped work when Billy went away and hadn't done a thing while he was away because Billy won't have a nut or a bolt fixed during his absence and without his personal supervision. That was in the old days, mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Billy. He's really got a remarkable man, Eamon. In his own line of country, of course, without doubt he's a genius. And furthermore, as a personal, in a personal capacity, he never forgets an old friend. And today, he and his companies still bank with that bank where I first met him. Thank you, Howard Roberts. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. This is your life, Billy Butler, and often in the early 1930s, you walk around your amusement parks and see bedraggled and miserable holidaymakers sheltering from the rain because they can't return to their digs until mealtime. You remember the vacation camps in Canada, and in 1935, you purchase a site in Skegness and start to build your own camp designed wholly by yourself. You employ your own labor, with the exception of well borers. But at Easter, 1936, your opening date is very much touch and go. It was about the worst 48 hours I ever spent. He was head engineer of that first camp. He's still with you today. Come in, Norman, Norman Bradford. Bradford. <laughs> now, Norman, will you tell us why touch and go? Well, uh, the camp was well ahead generally, uh, with the exception of one thing, uh, our own water supply. We had a small supply in from outside, but not sufficient for the needs of the camp. And uh, so we brought in the well borers. I can guess, and they didn't strike water. Well, actually, what happened, uh, they went right past the water-bearing strata and were boring deeper and deeper and deeper and until it came 48 hours before the deadline of opening. So? Well, the boys worked right round the clock, and 24 hours before we opened, we had the gush. And I was able to tell Mr. Butlin that the water was there. To his obvious relief. Uh, so much so that as soon as we were piped up and the tanks were full and the water was around the camp, Mr. Butlin went round himself, turned on the taps, pulled the chains to make sure that the water would be there. <laughs> to make sure the water would be there for keeps. All right, thank you, Norman Bradford. Thank you. <laughs> A diving Thomas, eh? Well, your first holiday camp is underway, anyhow, providing a new holiday habit for thousands. Now, after Skegness comes Clacton and the purchase of a new site at Filey, but before you can start to build, uh, you find your country at war for the second time in your life. The military step in, and overnight, the laughter and gaiety of the campers is replaced by the barked orders of service instructors as Britain turns her civilians into sailors, soldiers, and airmen. And before long, you too get a call from the war office. To tell us about that, come in, Lieutenant Colonel Basil Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what was this summons to the war office, Colonel? Well, that was from the war minister, the late Mr. Horbelisha, who said that because of the shortages in, in training establishments, he wanted Bill to build his Filey camp for RAF occupancy. And then after that, the Admiralty asked him to do some prospecting for them. As a result of which, there came into being um, HMS Glendower in Pathelli, Wales, and HMS Scotia in Ayrshire, Scotland. Now, those were two ships which never put out to sea, in spite of the fact that Lord Haw Haw claimed to have sunk them both. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the middle of all this, we understand that he received a, another call from the Ministry of Supply. Yes, uh, that was from uh, Lord Beaverbrook, who asked him to 
go around the ordnance factories in this country and build hostels and equip them with canteens and the like for, of course, this tremendous influx of, uh, of factory workers that's coming. And with the turn of the tide in Europe, he receives yet another call for his services, this time from uh, General Montgomery. Yes, th that's right. With the, with the conquest of Europe uh, getting underway, General Montgomery decided that the troops must have first-class leave centers to, to provide them uh, with, with, with a relaxation from, from, from battle. Uh, and he'd heard, of course, of, of Bill's work in this country uh, for the services uh, and for the factory workers. And so he decided uh, that Bill Buckling was the man to talk to. And the result was the uh, 21 clubs for Allied servicemen. Yes, the, the 21 clubs. The first one in Brussels. There it is there. And then it was followed by others in Antwerp, Eindhoven, and Scheide, and the last of all in, in Hamburg. And there are hundreds of thousands of British troops who will remember, and remember Bill with gratitude, the facilities which were provided for them at the time that they needed it most. Thank you, Colonel Brown. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for his services to his country, Billy Butlin was awarded the MBE. Now, at last, peace returns to this island with the task of clearing up. And to a country starved of relaxation for so long, thoughts naturally turn again to holidays. And slowly, you reopen your caps. Leisure with pleasure is your object. But uh, to these, something else is now added. It turned out the most wonderful innovation. The senior chaplain to your camps, the Reverend Tom Pugh. <laughs> Now tell me, what, what was this innovation, Canon Pew? That uh, the church should go and work on the Butlin camps. Uh, Mr. Butlin had seen the work in action uh, with the troops in the factories, and he felt sure that the work of the church ought to continue in peacetime on his camps. Mm -hmm. And then he made a call, didn't he? Uh, yes, I received a letter from the Bishop of Lincoln invite him to take over the uh, chaplains to the campus Skegness. And although I didn't meet Mr. Butler for some time, I was fully conscious that he was not unaware of what we were doing. And it was shortly after that, wasn't it, you had your first uh, tug of war, so to speak, yeah? <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Butler felt... You won. We ought not to... <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Butler felt we ought not to... The only time... The, uh, Mr. Butler felt we ought not to wear the um, cassock on the camps. And he told me that um, he felt that the um, priest God uh, was uh, to um, drag. I, on the other hand, felt quite sure that the parson ought to be on the camp fundamentally as a parson. He's already just said uh, that you won. Is that true? Uh, yes, I think Mr. Butling came to see that uh, the campus liked to have their own parson. I knew that at the time. Yes. And I thought you might have a subduing effect. <laughs> <laughs> Would you, Canon, describe Bill here as a, as a hard-headed businessman? Uh, perhaps. But I would also think of him as a um, soft-hearted man. Soft-headed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know in my job that there are many acts of kindnesses uh, which never come to light. Um, people he's helped anonymously and he's a person, I would say, who does kindnesses without the left hand knowing what the right hand is doing. Thank you, Canon Tom Pugh. Thank you. Thank you. Mind you, what can be told is that Bill Butlin here and his campers have contributed over 80,000 pounds to the National Playing Fields Association. <laughs> I think I told you, Bill, that uh, on the way up on this fast car that we came in, that we were, in fact, preparing this story for another date. But uh, we thought that tonight it would make a very nice wedding present. So did your bride of today, Nora Butlin. <laughs> No, 
never trust your wife. <laughs> you can trust me always, darling. Anyway, uh, darling, I'm sorry. I dragged you away from a party. <laughs> but we are going to another one now. I hope so. Good. Yes, with all our friends, aren't we, Eamon? Quite right, Nora, and yes. I haven't met you today at all. All happiness to you. Thank you. And your friends here are backstage. Only some of them because there are millions. We have Rex North, your best man today, and his wife, Lynn Joyce. <laughs> Mantovani. Godfrey.